So hello everyone. Today uh, we'll be um, talking about refugee perspectives on breaking down barriers to education access for refugees. Um, on the panel, we'll have uh, three former refugees, um, Sudarshan uh, Pyakural, uh, Dayar Nasiri, and Dauda Sise. Um, we are super excited to host you all and have a conversation about some of the barriers that we're experiencing in the education system specifically for refugees. Um, Sudarshan uh, Pekarel is a member of the Bhutanese community in um, Columbus, Ohio, and is a former refugee from Bhutan. Uh, Mr. Uh, Pekarel is the executive director of the Bhutanese community of Central Ohio, and is a community leader and advocate for social justice. He is also the founder of the Bhutanese American Students Organization, uh, which is a nonprofit uh, higher education advocacy organization, uh, South Asian American Advocacy Forum, and founder and managing director uh, of the Yagaran America, a Nap Nepali newspaper that is published through Columbus, Ohio. He has a master's degree in English literature and a BA in economics and cultural anthropology. Uh, he uh, currently he's an MSW student at the Ohio State University. Um, part of his passion is applied social science. He's also the co author of several journal articles. Uh, he came to the US in 2010. Uh, since then, he has been actively working in the community for equity, advocacy, and empowerment of refugees and immigrants. Um, he is nationally certified a mental health first aid instructor, a member of the trauma responsive care through Care Coalition. He's also on the steering committee um, of Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration. Uh, he's a member of Refugee Congress representing Ohio and Migrant and Refugee Leadership Academy Fellow. He is fluent in English, Hindi, Nepali, and Urdu. And he was named in June 2018 by the Ohio Governor John Kasich and reappointed by Governor DeWine in January 2021 to the state's new American Advisory Committee. Uh, thank you, Sudarshan, for joining us today. Uh, we also have uh, Dayar, um, who will be joining us as well. Um, she's an Iraqi-American mother of two teenage girls. Uh, she's also a teacher um, and a certified interpreter and advocate. Uh, she's fluent in both Arabic and English. She works uh, with English as a second language students uh, to provide help as they navigate um, through their own experiences with the American public education system. And Diyar is a passion, passionate for uh, advocate for social advocacy and loves to help others. Um, Dauda Sise uh, is a vice chair of Refugee Congress Board of Directors and an honorary delegate for the state of Louisiana. Uh, Mr. Sise fled Sierra Leone due to the brutal war that led to the murder of his father and younger sister. While he was fleeing the military and the rebels, he was shot and seriously injured. In a refugee camp in the Gambia, he worked with other refugees to advocate for better living conditions and education for children. When his injury required further surgery, he moved to the capital where he met his wife, who's also a refugee. And when his medical condition deteriorated, to say, and his wife and their six month old daughter were resettled to the US. He's a founding member and president of the Louisiana Organization for Refugees and Immigrants, which is a nonprofit community-based organization that assists refugees and immigrants through various stages of integration into the US. He works with refugee families, coordinates help to new Americans uh, during times of natural disasters, and works with um, uh, to connect communities uh, and amplify refugee voices and build bridges. He's also a member of Mayor Sharon's Weston uh, Broom International Relations Commission and a chairperson of the Commission on Culture and Art Engagement, a commission established to help make the city of Baton Rouge more inclusive and welcoming. Um, he has a degree in applied science in process technology from Baton Rouge Community College. He's currently pursuing his DOJ accreditation and, a master, and master's. He's a proud father of five great children and in his free time, he likes playing soccer, doing fun activities with children and listening to music, specifically Afrobeats, um, Zydeco and country. Um, so these are uh, amazing people um, and we're absolutely excited to have them join us today because 
uh, as you heard through their bios, they've all experienced different parts of the education system and continue to engage with it today as well. Access to education for refugees is so much worse for non-refugees and it's important because education is key uh, for uh, the future of individuals, communities, and countries. And in normal circumstances, refugees already face tremendous hurdles in access ed education. At primary level, 63% of refugee children are enrolled in school compared to a global level of 91%. At secondary level, it's 24% for refugees uh, of enrollment. And for, for the world, it's 84%. That's almost a 60% gap. Um, according to the UN Commissioner for Refugees, only about 3%, 3% of the world's university age re refugees are able to actually access higher education. And COVID-19 has clearly posed even a greater challenge for refugees who are seeking to access a higher education. And while much of the talk today will be about access to education, many of uh, the things we'll talk about today will also focus on belonging and creating spaces for that as well. Um, I, I'd love to start with some questions for this uh, group. Um, and I'm wondering if, if you can share with us what your experience has been with education when you arrived to the US and how this education system is different from your host country and from your uh, country of birth. Um, thank you, Ida, for this opportunity to uh, speak today. Um, I'm Sudarshan, I'm from Columbus, Ohio currently. And I was resettled in uh, um, Cleveland, which is a two hour drive from Columbus in 2010. So when I arrived um, in 2010, the basic thing, the resettlement agency, they are great, they help refugees resettle, but when it comes to education, the resettlement program is really not designed to assist people looking for education. So basically in the beginning, they would uh, send everyone to get ESL classes uh, or basic English uh, and uh, job preparedness and things like that. So that was one of the uh, one of the opportunity as well as challenge for me personally. Um, I came to US uh, with college degree and I was wanting to continue my education. However, uh, resources were very, very limited. Um, and I have to figure it out myself. Now, how is the education system in the United States different from where I came from? Well, it's entirely different uh, in so many ways, but primarily uh, what I had experienced is the US education is more uh, hands on deck, right? practical education that, uh, and also very formalized and um, has a, a, a systematic way of uh, teaching. And uh, um, what, what do I mean by that is more, the US education is sort of you know, providing you tools and technology uh, in, in terms of not only learning process, but also uh, in terms of implementing that education that you're learning. So in that sense, in brief, I'm saying it's very practical um, job oriented or work oriented or skill oriented education um, and not so much focusing on the academic side, which I have learned back back in India, Nepal, uh, where I did my higher education there. Thank you for sharing that, Sudarshan. It's really interesting to um, hear you talk about the, the layers of barriers that are in your way as you're trying to achieve your goals. So sharing that. Um, Dodai, I'm, um, I would love to hear from you and your thoughts on the same question. Um, thank you so much, um, Sudarshan, for sharing um, your experience and Ada and the rest of the team for organizing this um, great event. I am honored and grateful to be part of this. <laughs> and yes, my experience um, here in the United States, let me just give you a, um, a brief context. Um, um, I did not have a college degree before I got to the US. Um, because of the war back home, which um, because of the war back home, which um, damaged my childhood dreams, but was those dreams and inspiration were still there. So I came to the U.S. and have the second chance um, of life and to get to school. 
So I took the first opportunity I get, which is to get them um, to do my GED. And, I, and after I passed my GED test, and then the anticipation and eagerness to go to college, in my mind, we are uncontrollable because I knew that I would have the opportunity to achieve my childhood dreams and fulfill my father's wish. And I vividly remember my late dad expressions with a radiant smile, how he wishes to see his children graduated from college, an opportunity my father and sibling didn't have. In short, that means my father wants us to get a college degree with the family they didn't get. Um, unfortunately, at those times during the war back home, it kills that inspiration and that dream. So coming to the US and enrolling in college, definitely um, waking up that spirit and to fulfill my dad's wish. So the instant again that admission to, um, to the community college, I knew it wasn't just a college admission. I knew I was beginning the journey of being my family first college graduate, and most importantly, honor my late dad. But unfortunately, my very first semester in college was so dear to me and was in my mind, the beginning of healing of my past trauma and I faced with bullying and with traumatic experiences as well. Unfortunately, it was not by, my, by the student, it was by my professor. She chooses to call me names, like, like the slave boy, Kunta Kinte, in as much as I try my best um, to show him how to pronounce my name. That would be as simple as it is. And that, would that means in English, David. I tried all of those, but sadly, that professor ignore all the efforts and she continued to pick on me and call me funny names. But in the mix of all those experiences, I was overwhelmed with emotion to see my and to see my compassionate um, students, classmates who sees value in me and reported the issues to the dean on my behalf. And that in itself uh, makes me believe that there are so many generous people in this nation that doesn't think like others people. So that experience in the educational system within my very first semester was a heartbroken. But at the same time, it empowers me because of seeing the generosity of the American people, especially my fellow classmates. If not for them, I don't know if I could have been able to continue um, and get my degree. Because always people say first impression goes a long way. And that first impression wasn't good for me. But, um, but it turns for a better and as an inspiration. And that was continuing to inspire me to do the work I'm doing currently so that no other students, no other person should go through what I went through. So thank you. Dorot, uh, thank you for sharing that story with us and, and being vulnerable in this space with us to, to share uh, that impact of on bullying that it can have um, and, and how you went through it and kept that dream that you had in your mind as a goal and experienced both a hateful um, feelings from your professor, but love and generosity from your community. That's really powerful. Thank you. Um, I'm curious uh, if you don't mind sharing with us briefly uh, why you think your father saw education as an important thing for you. My dad was a traditional leader back home, like a chief, um, a chief census back home, and he doesn't have that opportunity to go to school. And if letters were sent to him, he has to find someone to read it. And at an early age, while I was in, in junior school, sometimes I read those letters. And that uncomfortable asking 
people to do it. And also she wishes the best for all of us. And she want to see her children become a doctor. Like that was my wish. Uh, at that time, at a younger age, I want to become a doctor, either a gynecologist or pediatrician. And I had that dream to be that. And the reason because um, my country, Sierra Leone, we have at the time the highest infant mortality rate and maternity rate. And during those times, I was thinking, what can I do to help? So being a pediatrician, I can help the children or gynecologist, I can help um, the woman, one of those two. And my dad was so supportive and want that family to have a college degree. So she invested, so, he invested so much, my parents invested so much, but unfortunately, um, he was taken away. Thank you uh, for sharing that with us, Dauda. Um, you know, they are, I'm, I'm so curious to hear about your experience on the same question. And um, in addition to being an amazing person in, in the field of education and all of the experiences that you went through and, and how it is also to be a mother of teenage daughters that are also in the education system today too. Yes, hi, thank you guys for this opportunity. I'm sorry about the circumstances. Uh, for me, we came in the 90s and I was already had my bachelor degree. So I really didn't, did not need to go to school here. And my, so I stayed home. I started a family, stayed home with my kids. And then my husband went to finish to do, get his master. And one of the things he faced that back the the technology is way ahead of us here in this country than where we came from. So he struggled a lot about how to man, man, like manage the studying and all using all those technology things and he, he had to teach himself. Uh, and then I ended up taking some classes in college, but I didn't pursue anything because I couldn't find a field that I really speak to me. I, I like helping people. I need, I like to have a nonprofit. That's my passion. So I, I'm still looking for that. But my experience with my girls, uh, since we didn't work, grow up in this country, so we didn't experience schools. So I, I've learned with them the system and every uh, level has its own challenges, like the elementary school and the middle and the high school and now it's college. Uh, it's totally different uh, system here. You need a lot of involvement from the parents. Like the school is shared. It's the responsibility for any child's education is shared half and half between the school and the parents. And it's like that we work as a team with them. And then when you, they get older, you get more, they get more complicated. And it, it comes to like, choosing classes and uh, and the high school you have to navigate college and choosing all this and dealing with counselor so every every step of it has a challenge but you have to work through it and you learn with them and that's basically my experience in an in a nutshell Thank you, Dara, for sharing with us. It's one thing to have to think about how you go through it and what your dreams and aspirations are, but another thing to facilitate with children what that process could look like. They're experiencing their own thing. So thank you for sharing with us. Thank you. Uh, I wonder if for the group, um, a, a question I, I'd love to see what you think about is, what are some things that you found to be valuable? Um, uh, throughout your educational journey. You know, Dada, you mentioned a great story of people being able to support you uh, during the difficult process in class. And, um, you know, I wonder how your process was for getting your uh, GED and um, Sudarshan, you know, you've, you've dedicated your um, uh, life to pursuing education and now you're also in school. And um, I'd love to hear from you guys, what are some helpful tools that you found in your journey? Um, as Dauda said, uh, US is very resourceful if you wanted to use those resources. And that is true, but also 
so I, I think I'll talk about the challenges later on. Uh, one thing that I found was uh, the school system here has uh, you know, equipped with advisors at a different level. And those advisors can talk to you and really guide you what you wanted to do and what you want to be. Um, and also help you think through the uh, uh, difficult transition that you have to make. And you know, transitioning to US education system is not easy. Um, a lot of fellows who come to US for higher education actually prepares many years before coming to United States. So they would have completed many um, you know, prerequisites and pre uh, preliminary needs and also what college they wanted to go and what education they want to pursue. So they come here prepared and then enroll into school and it's easy for them. But for refugees, they don't come here to actually pursue higher education. They come here as a last resort of survival. And they, they have their families, they have to pay their bills. Uh, they even most of them don't even can afford to go to school. And in that tight, and it, you know, tight um, uh, time schedule or uh, life, uh, the valuable thing that you'll find in the US is um, uh, that you can take classes flexibly. Now, back in where I come from, you have to take class in a specific time or you'll miss classes or you'll not be able to continue. So in the US, you can, you know, take one class, two class, evening class, weekend classes. So those have been very, very helpful. So depending, although you may have very busy schedule, pay your bills, but if you're really looking for pursuing higher education, you just have to ask and find a place where you can, uh, you know, put yourself uh, in that sport. That could be Friday evening, that could be Saturdays and whatnot. So that is very helpful. That's what I find helpful. And then I would be able to change things around, you know, change, talk to my boss at the workplace and say, and I have a class in the evening. Can I go early or I have class on certain days? Can I not come on those days? And they have been accommodating as my needs. And I was able to work at the same time, uh, continue with my education. That's so great to hear you had that experience, Sudarshan, because being able to navigate a complex schedule is so hard, um, generally, especially if, if you're working full time too. Um, Dauda, I, I noticed you were going to mention something as well. Um, yes, um, I just gonna buttress uh, Sudash points, um, which is basically um, those are different um, category that she that he highlighted that has been helpful, which is the counselors in schools and the flexibility of classes. And now, for the other thing I just wanna mention that is a challenging is like most of us as refugees that come here, you come with a family you have to go to college and then you have to work and then you get a baby a child at home so time management has been like a bigger challenge also how you manage your time and you come in here newly um, you hardly speak the language you hardly know your way around and then the process of going through to apply and getting admissions and all the things that you have to go through and all of those, if you don't have a support system and a group to help you, and that is challenging. And I definitely, um, thank God for me, I do have a few helps, which um, I know even though I have the help, it was challenging for me to go through all those process, feeling the FAFSA and all of that. And, and that is challenging. So getting the human resource and the help, that is great. And another thing I wanted to mention again is, this is an experience I get as a parent uh, with the school system overall. And at least some of the school, they need to increase their cultural competence, training to their, the teachers, knowing that you got family that comes from different backgrounds, you get kids that are in school that are come from different backgrounds, but um, they don't take to, that into consideration. Um, I remember I had an issue with my son when he's in school. He had never been to school before, He not, not in a daycare. He was raised home by his grandma. And grandma teaches him the traditional way, which is you don't look your, your adult in their face when they are talking to you. <laughs> to us, it's a sign of disrespect. So my son, when he started school, 
he went to school and when the teacher is talking to him, it was just like bow down and talk to the teacher. And the teacher complained about the same notes and give me F and I have a conference with the teacher and we sit down and talk. And she told me that Dauda is not paying attention whenever she is talking to him, he's not maintaining high contact. So I had to calm down. I said, okay. And then I had to explain to the teacher and know the cultural differences because he was raised by his grandma. And, and he doesn't maintain eye contact when talking to grandma because to him it's a disrespect. So that my son is still demonstrating that respect to you by not maintaining eye contact. I said, and this is his first time in school. So just be patient, he will come around. So, so those are little things, but it goes a long way because psychologically it was affecting the child because the child saying always negative grades. So you see, so sensitization and bringing awareness and that is unhelping tools because having that conference, that one-on-one -on -one conversation with the teacher, I taught him, he has a different um, perspective now about kids in school. So, and I believe most of us should encourage our um, community member to do the same. If certain things is going on, set up a conference with your teacher, the teachers and go have a one-on-one -on -one with them. Sometimes you realize that your child is not actually doing something terrible. It's just a misunderstanding within the culture and tradition. Yeah, so thank you. That's a, a really incredible uh, point. And it's also fantastic to hear about your experience as a parent navigating that system. And uh, cultural competencies is, is really such a critical piece. and also the mental health aspect that you mentioned and in, in dealing with that your first year in college. I, I wondered, uh, Dan, one of the things you talked about too is um, if you're able to, I, I know that you, are, you have an emergency. So if you hear us, let me know. Um, one of the things I'm, I'm so curious about is your experience in, in your involvement in, in your daughters and uh, the cultural competency with schools not being able to have um, any access to books that look like your daughters. Um, and especially, you know, you have, you're raising two strong, powerful Muslim young girls. So I wonder if you can share that story with us. Um, sure. That came late. I mean, I mean, uh, after many years, they realized, and we started in a nonprofit. We started in 2018, uh, based on an experience that happened to them in, uh, in elementary. In fourth grade, there is a project, they call it the Wax Museum. You choose a, 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 a person or a, a figure, it doesn't have in history or any, any, any time of life, but you need to have a book that written about them to make a report and to dress as the character and talk about it. So of course, both of my girls wanted to choose one of um, many of the Muslim women we talk about and we, tell them story about. And we went to the library, uh, public library of our town, and we couldn't find anything about any of those women. So that was kind of hard ache for them. So they chose different thing. And then that was uh, like a light bulb. It says that there is something missing in this culture and schools and in the libraries. And then we didn't, you know, they were young, but then Two years ago, 2018, they read a book. The character, her name is the same name as my daughter. She eats the same food we eat. She goes to mass. She does a lot of things. That hit a bulb, a light bulb in their head. And this, there's people in books represent them. And then they linked all those experience together and they decided to open a nonprofit to collect books and to, uh, about Muslim women and put them in a list and then donate them to schools and libraries. And it's been really successful to bring all those representation to schools and libraries for all to read, for the, for the non-Muslim to know about those culture and read about them and to know, and for those girls to, and boys and to know about, see themselves in books and been represented in school and in the dialogue. 
that's so beautiful to hear they are and is it true is it in seven different countries that you've sent the books to is that correct eight so far yes eight oh, countries eight. and and many states that's fantastic to hear yes that's a great and example thank you and when they were young at the elementary school i used to go once a year to their school to talk about our holiday the eid so the kids will understand when christmas time comes Zina and Mina does not, well, my girls will not celebrate Christmas, but that's okay because they have their own holiday. And we mm -hmm. talk about the holiday and we, I take treat to the kids. And my girls think that now talk about it. They think that's the best day of the school year for them when I go and talk to them because they make them feel they're part of this culture. They're part of this community. They also have their own holidays and things. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that story with us. Thank there. you. Thank you. Um, you know, I wonder, we touched on this a little bit earlier with um, Dada's story and Sudarshan, what you shared as well. Um, uh, but I wonder, what are some things that educators can do um, to make refugees feel more welcome in the classroom and confident to be in those spaces? And then also, what are some things, professional development that they can get to be more equipped to handle those spaces? We talked about getting some cultural competency training um, and, and you know, being able to create spaces where you feel welcome with all of the students supporting you, Dada. I, I wonder if you can add a little bit more to that. I think Dada's story was amazing when it comes to his personal experience and his child's experience um, uh, getting into the school. Uh, we simply say it, the school need to be culturally equipped or they need to be provided cultural humility training, but oftentimes that does not happen. It, you know, it's a technical thing. You have to get through the bureaucracies and as a refugee, you cannot advocate them to have a cultural uh, competency training for the teachers who are doing is the school administration that they, they have to make those decisions. And for that to happen, the resettlement agency need to play because they are stakeholders in the community. They place these uh, students into the school system and, um, and also because they, they can uh, say why there is a need to understand the cultures of the refugees and understanding refugee background. But it's very, very, very essential. If kids are going to certain school district, the school administration and teacher need to understand what culture practice they have, what kind of holidays they celebrate and where they are coming from. It is essential because kids could be coming to school with trauma with depression, with PTSD and whatnot, because they have been in refugee camp for a long time. And oftentimes, if even kids, children are growing up in the United States, trauma, depression, anxiety, this is, um, does not go away within the first generation. Even the children inherit some of the trauma from their parents and they may act weird. So it is where we have to really educate and uh, stakeholders, stakeholders like ours, you know, Refugee Congress or uh, Refugee Resettlement Program really have to play a, a critical role or important role in doing so. We as individual can go there and talk to school administration. We can talk to the teachers or we can provide a training. And that way we have to build this partnership it is very important, but I would, I would give this time to doubt it. Just really share the stories because the stories are more powerful than anything else when we are trying to convey a message. My, you know, I've gone, because I already had a prior education uh, before coming to United States, my own story is, in, uh, is still a full of struggle because when I came to United States, the resettlement agency wanted me to go to work, find a work that was in a housekeeping or in a warehouse. And I was saying to them, I wanted to go to college. Of course, I will be in the meantime going to, you know, working whatever place you wanted to put me. But do I have a place to start my education? And they didn't have much other than to say, go to ESL classes. And um, it took me eight years, eight years to realize that I could have already started a master's program back in 2011. And uh, so basically the advice that I got was, first you go to community college, what they think generally is if you are coming from a refugee camp, they, they don't think you have education. And if you do, they don't think it is you know, an education really. And if you are speaking English to some extent, and they would think that you have you know, working proficiency in English, but they really, education is not about being able to speak a language. 
knowledge is a way different thing. The ability to grasp a knowledge is entirely different from being able to speak a language. And they judge from the ability to speak language. And so teachers need to really understand how you know students learn is different than where uh, what they speak and where they grow up. And uh, they have to provide that accommodations. Like I have friends who have masters in mathematics and physics, they could be teaching physics and mathematics in school, but they cannot speak fluent English, they would never be selected for that position. And at the same time, the same school district is looking for math teacher in India and whatnot. So those kind of things that educators need to be aware that if they have a resources and if they have resources from refugee community, they can provide additional training and empower them to be able to be educators themselves. And they would be a great resource to that school district because these teachers can bring experience, knowledge from the refugee community. At the same time, they can teach the course in the colleges. And, uh, but we haven't done much in this area, um, especially refugees are, pushed into workforce uh, so much so that they didn't get a chance to go to college. There are a very small number of refugees I've seen pursuing higher education. I have started myself uh, higher education advocacy organization. I've been continuously working to advocate for higher education. If my generation folks now who are in their 40s or late 30s, there are hardly 20 people um, in a 90,000 population had managed to get a master's degree in the United States. So that's how difficult, but they already had a prior education coming to the United States. They're you know, much smarter than me. So the uh, not being able to provide opportunity to refugee for pursuing higher education is one of the biggest drawback the system as a system we have here in the United States. We have fantastic school system. We have fantastic college system, but how do you get into that system? They don't have a method to help refugees. And that is what we need to advocate is to help this refugee get into the system. And once they are into the system, system is good if they want to you know, get education and what have education and whatnot. So that, that's my experience. And also that's what I advocate personally. Wow, thank you, Sudarshan. That's uh, extremely powerful and so important uh, for people to be able to hear that. Uh, so many important messages you mentioned around uh, language not being an indicator of knowledge and uh, so many people coming to the U.S. without uh, speaking English, which was my experience and being pushed into work uh, without really th thinking only of surviving as opposed to thriving and your experience that you mentioned out earlier about being a parent too and you know trying to manage your entire schedule around family and being able to make money in addition to pursuing education, which was your passion. Uh, I wonder, uh, what are your thoughts on the question around what we can do, uh, what educators can do and um, to help refugees arrive in the classroom, Dada? Well, thank you. Um, thank you again. And first, I just want to make it clear that um, the teachers, they are doing an amazing job. And imagine you are in a classroom of 20, um, more than 20 students or kids and with different background, different identity and different way of life. So managing all of those is really, 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 really tough. And so teachers are doing an amazing job. And my uncle always used to say this, if you can read this, if you can read anything, thanks a teacher, <laughs> because it taught you how to read and maintain you. But we are focused more on the system as an institution, even though we mentioned because the school system needs to empower the teachers, give them the tools for them to be successful and for the students also to be successful when they come to school. Yes, like the issue that I had with a teacher, which is an international school, they call it, they call the school an international school, but this teacher has no clue about that part of that traditions. So you see, but I had to have a conversation with the teacher for her to learn about that issue with my son. So that is one thing that we need to make sure that we have that conversation with the school board or whatever institution in other states that are in, in charge of um, education to have that conversation. Because it is very important. Uh, because in the school system, that's where the future leaders are developed. 
that's where they're coming from. So if you don't have a solid foundation to train those leaders, we will get what we got in 2016 and above, <laughs> the polarization. So we have to have a system. We are the kids because whatever you say, whatever you do is impacting other students that are in the class, that teacher. So you have to be mindful your action, your words and your deeds are impactful um, to other students. Because trust me, when a kid learn something new at school or something strange, they'll bring it home to their parents and, and talk about it. I got that conversation with my, my kids so many times. Oh, my teacher say A, B, and C. That's what you think. So, so it is has to be like a collective um, between the, the, the school system, the parents, and the teachers. We all come together and find a better equilibrium where we can empower our kids and empower the future leaders for tomorrow so that everyone, it, so that it can be a win-win. Everybody wins. The student wins, come out and become a better citizens and give back to the community. The community wins because we have productive citizens that have come and be part of the community and lead going forward. So the refugees community, we are part of this community. We come in here to rebuild our lives. We come in here to get to, get to a new part. Yes, some of our kids, they have to start in school. Some of them have to start in middle school. Some of them have a strange name, foreign names that is different. Yeah, some of them have that. And name is very, very important. So all of those teachers taking the time to pronounce name, as simple as that, it's very impactful because you are teaching the other children to respect people's names because all of us, our names meant so much to us. That's the first gift you have as a human being. That's the first gift. Before you were born, your parents, they discuss, they sit down to see which name they're gonna give you. And they wanna give you the best name that has the best meaning that can project your future. So, so pronouncing, taking the time to learn how to pronounce somebody's name, an individual name, it is very essential because that's the first gift given to mankind, your name. <laughs> yes, when you come to this world. So yes, for teachers to just listen and know that their words, their deeds impact lives for generations to come. So they just have to be careful and engage. I, I, I love what you mentioned, um, too, about how it doesn't only impact the people and students in the school, it also impacts the community. I, I wonder, uh, in terms of our next question, what, what are some, from a community lens, what are some things that uh, host communities that um, have refugees uh, as their neighbors, what are some things that they can do to help also advocate for increased access to education? and opportunities for refugees? I think community do, do play a very important role. Uh, the host community do play an important role. And I wanted to second what Daoud has said, that teachers are doing an amazing job for sure. Um, and it's, we are talking about the system only, where there are gaps in the system. Um, community uh, where refugees are hosts uh, generally um, seen as a, a more accepting than communities where they you know they if they don't welcome refugees there's no way resettlement agencies can bring refugees into those communities at the same time what i had seen is um, uh, sooner or later uh, a silos get created around the refugee community and uh, um, and refugees are uh, put into that silos um, for better or worse. And because the refugees are hesitant to, uh, you know, go outside their silos because they are still in a survival instinct, they wanted to know very few things. Okay, generally, if you wanted to know where they can work and bring money, where they can go shopping, and then the healthcare need. So. Other than that, they don't want to explore a lot of things. One, there's a hesitation, there is a language issue, there is a you know a trauma issue, and of course, there is a fear for discrimination. And people do experience when they cross the line, sort of, 
if they go to other communities. I've experienced myself, you know, I like to drive around and see things. And uh, when you reach out to a particular neighborhood, you would be, uh, uh, you would face with a lot of discriminatory practices over there. So the host community can really provide that platform for these refugees. For example, I wanted to give an example. I've been, since COVID, I stopped doing it, which is to help school organize Parents' Day, Refugee Immigrant Parents' Day. And it's to convince the school counselor, or school teacher, school management to have and invite community members. And we used to do that. And then this community member would bring amazing food to the host community. And of course, the host community would also bring food and then the conversation would start. And these are simple things that uh, really makes a difference when they test food, when they get a chance to know about their stories. And I wanted to, again, start when things get normal, which is to ask each school, like primary school, middle school, it doesn't matter. If it has a refugee population, ask them to host a day for immigrants. And then they would bring food from both sides and have conversation. And the other thing is that one of the refugee will, do, whoever is willing, will get a chance to share their story. So humanizing them. And if the host community provides that opportunity to humanize them, we have done uh, here in Columbus, a few of them we wanted to continue because that was the most effective than doing anything else. You know, going to a lawmaker or talking to a, a school administrator is of course an important thing, but connecting with the community. And when the host community advocates for refugee, that's a thousand times better than <laughs> I am doing. Uh, you know, that work. So these are the strategy I have been working and uh, we wanted to continue. And I, I recommend that uh, to other refugee leaders who are uh, passionate about higher education and involving your children uh, in education system is to have a immigrant parent day or refugee immigrant parents day in your school district, in your school, in, in that uh, uh, small pockets of the neighborhood where you live. That's an incredibly powerful example. It's and, and like you said, it's simple, but it can create so much, uh, so much good. Um, and Dada, I'd love your thoughts as well. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, that's a very good thing. All I'm just going to add is yes. Um, to let the community in, impact the community for it has to begin with we, because it has been so much so long people are talking about us telling our stories putting names adding names and adjectives to us so it's high time that we have to step up and take that narrative on it because when you allow others to tell your story you are giving them so much power over you so you don't want to do that you have to take that power back take the power back and own it and tell your stories and then find ways that you can bring community together. And I love what Suda shared about food. Yes, in Louisiana here, we got what we call the gombo, uh, which is a blend of everything in there. So it's not just about eating the food, bring food that are traditional food together and then shows the strength and power of diversity in that food. And when we have some talk here, we bring that up like one of our events and then we talked about the food i said look in this food look the ingredients that are in there you got meat you have different spices put in that and now you eat the food and it tastes good well guess what take out two one or two of the most ingredients in that food or that sauce you prepared the taste will completely be different it won't taste the same again. So that's inclusion. Everybody in your city, in your state matters. We need every, all of us can promote um, our, the economic and social well-being of our states. So if you take away one, the state don't taste the same again. Just like how the food won't taste the same again. So let own the story and being diversity. There are so many ways. And like what happened with the students when they stepped up. Look what happened around the refugees' admission and the refugee rallies. 
when we own the story, when we tell our stories, look how impactful it is. A lot of people know about refugees now that they didn't know. Like in Masquerade, I'll talk about for Louisiana. A lot of people know, people are calling us. People are, some people are calling us and thanking us for sharing your story and impact them. You change lives. So all I, one thing I just want to say, it, it begins with us. Let's take our power back. Let us don't give power to the people that want to tell our story. Let's own our own stories and educate the communities about our cultures, our tradition, and how the culture and tradition is alike with the, the host nation. So it's not different. It's a different way. Certain food, we call the food different back where we came from, but it's similar food here. <laughs> It's the same thing. It's just the name and the way you go about it. But at the end of the day, we are all heading to achieving one goal, which is the well-being of mankind. So the well-being of everyone, everyone feel welcome and feel belongs. Trust me, there is no, nothing worse than the feeling of being an unwelcome guest. So, and I urge community members, don't try to fit in. Try to belong. Mm. Try to make adjustment to belong because there's a difference between feeling and belongs. You belong, you're part of this community, you have the right and the responsibility to hold your leaders accountable. Don't be on the sideline. Get engaged and involved. So that's all I just wanted to say. Um. <laughs> Wow, you know, uh, put, thinking through that, um, belonging sounds like a really delicious recipe um, for sure. Um, but I wonder uh, if you don't mind me following up, given your uh, expertise as well, um, thinking about just mental health as a barrier to higher education as well, and trauma support in being able to um, uh, be, support refugees going through that as they pursue uh, any um, level of education, primary, secondary, or higher education. I, I wonder, um, uh, as we go into our last question about what advice uh, you have for our newcomers uh, that are coming in as refugees, I wonder if you can also talk about that aspect of uh, what are some things we can do to also support um, refugees that have experienced trauma and, and um, are seeking mental health support as well. Yes, for those who are coming right now or those who are just getting this settled, my message is simple. Go ask. Ask someone until you find your answer. Okay, and experience does matter. As I said, it took me eight years to get back into the master's program that I should have been in in 2011. But I help a friend who didn't have to go through all those things and he was able to get into the uh, MSW program and he graduated actually. So. Ask someone who has been through, ask until you get the solution. The other thing is that um, until and unless you ask, you will not get the right information. So for those who are coming and you wanted to pursue higher education, um, the only way is to find a mentor. Um, and there are many who would be willing to be a mentor. Those who are in college, those who are in professions and those who are in the refugee resettlement program. So ask for a mentor and what you want it to become, where you can go and how you can do it. The mental health trauma issue um, is very important. Part of my life is, uh, you know, engaged and dedicated uh, into understanding and providing mental health services. Uh, I'm into MSW program for the same reason. Refugees do come with trauma and mental illness. Um, but there's an incredible, you know, amount of resiliency in the people. They can just get through it. But there are some, a small number of them who struggle with it. And it always starts at the refugee resettlement program itself. I don't know, refugee resettlement program are doing an amazing job. Um, we uh, are very much thankful as refugees and we have to help them. But government really need to help this refugee resettlement agency to actually identify people who are struggling with mental illness in the first place, because that's the key sort of when refugees come to the US, refugees go through this resettlement agency and it's the right time to screen them and identify who have mental health issue and follow up and provide. Once they get dispersed into the community, it's very difficult because they are on their own. As I said already, 
they would just have these silos and they would just live within those silos. And mental health get worse and worse and worse. You wouldn't be able to identify when things get out of hand. So local agencies uh, and, and then local governments who are opening and welcoming refugees and uh, providing funding for refugee resettlement program need to add a dollar into refugee screening and mental health screening. That's the only place. If we miss it, we miss it. You can talk thousand things and you can make uh, 100 videos and try to reach out to the communities. Those often go, you know, untargeted. It's very difficult because people don't have time to, uh, you know, get, get to listen to you or they, they miss it, the important input. So basically I'm saying resettlement agencies are doing a fantastic job, but when it comes to mental illness, trauma or mental health, we have to address in the first 90 days itself. That's it. That's my message. Thank you for that message, Sudarshan, especially uh, as somebody who's dedicating his life to supporting uh, those um, that are dealing with trauma. It's great to hear that. Uh, Dota, I'd love to hear your thoughts on um, what are some things you think, what is your message for the newcomers? Yes, um, thank you so much. This is very, very um, pressing issues. And as we talked about reset, our church where and uh, Sudash and where the resettlement agency has to do more. Um, refugees like us, we already came to the US after experience one of the worst humanitarian crises. Some of us have watched our parents taken away. Some of us have seen family members, friends and houses shattered. You come up with all those stressors. Now, the one goal of resettlement here is the first four months they rush you in towards self-sufficiency. And even though they know that there's a language barrier and for you to successfully go into there. So the time it takes, the rush of self-sufficiency, yes, everybody wanna be independent, but you don't have to rush it. You have to assess the needs of the individuals and the family and act accordingly. But that is one of the biggest problems um, that I've seen working with refugees in my states and, and also working with the resettlement agency, advocating and engaging with them. That is one thing that I saw that's the biggest problem, this rush to self-sufficiency. Because you get them the, any job they could take. And once they get that job, after three months, they were on their own. And I faced that. And secondly, we have to be, be bold and speak up. And I always say this, and, and community need to know that to take away the stigma, the stigma that's associated with this mental health, let it be looked at like any other disease is treatable. Just like someone have malaria, you have diabetic, you have high blood pressure, let mental health be seen like that and encourage people to seek help when it's needed. Yes, the stigma is the biggest problem. And everything I do, like even telling my stories, go out and talk, is, is I'm not doing it for myself. I'm doing it, not I'm sorry, not just for myself. And I'm doing it to impact others. If someone out there listen to me and knowing that, okay, hey, me and this person have similar, situation, similar experience, but these are the steps that he takes to help himself. Maybe I might try that. Even if I impact one life in any conversation that I have, and I will be appreciative because of that. Yes, um, mental health is real. I've been through it, all this. And, and you will not, you know that, and it's very simple and very easy when you go and talk to someone. And I remember the one that I was with. And at some point, he was in tears. Yeah, my social worker was in tears listening to me. And this is his words that he has not met anyone that has impacted his life. You know I mean, so speak up and encourage, let's teach more of the signs so people to understand the signs that will no, you will notice that, okay, you know what? I'm having some flashbacks. I'm having an issue that I need to speak to someone. Let's encourage those signs so that 
once they identify, people can do self-evaluation um, knowing that, okay, you know what? These are the symptoms around these issues. All right, you know what, let me seek help. But if they don't understand the symptoms associated with that, it will be difficult for them to seek help, knowing that this is what they're going through. And also community members, also families also should understand also the symptoms because close family can help talk to someone and then and seek help. But we have to do more in the education and the resettlement agency has to assess cases as well and know how they rushed into pulling those people within those three months of investment, as I call it, three or four months of investment, which sometimes is basically going the wrong directions. If um, going the wrong directions, and I've seen that here um, through my organization, when we had to step in to help family, we become a community companion and a community partners, a companion with families and just being there as a source of comfort, some a community to listen to, someone that have your back. So thank you. I'm so emotional <laughs> talking about it. That's a really powerful message. Um, thank you for sharing that with us, and also for uh, I. As this gets shared, I, I also hope that many people hear you and your message because it's incredibly important. Um, and thank you for being so uh, open and vulnerable and strong uh, with this group to share it with us. Thank you, Dauda. And they are, um, we, we'd love to hear your thoughts um, uh, on and what's already been shared and also your message to the newcomers that are arriving and uh, what are some uh, advice uh, that you can share with them for anything and, and also how they can participate in the education system in a way that helps them not only survive, but thrive? Sure. There's many, many questions came up and I want to answer some of them. Uh, for the system, yes, the system, because the system in this country, it does not give a lot of um, attention to education. So always education is short and money on budget. So be because I work in a district is fortunate, they have little money. So they have a position that's called family liaison is where this, this person that connect these families, the refugees with the school system and help them with all the school things and conferences and explaining to them and help the teachers and the school, the district to explain to them about this new refugees and their culture. So that's a really a good resource. Every community that hosts a new complex, a new influx of refugees to hire if, if it's possible, I know it's hard to hire one that speak every language in every community, but that makes it so much easier to train or to help those uh, school system to be more aware of this culture of the new uh, refugees that's settling in. Because with ignorant about that culture comes the bully, because there is a question here, and I see it with my kids, not my girls, but my, the student I work with, uh, because of the kids not aware of what is this, so they get bullied, like with the girls that wearing hijab in the school, they get bullied for that, just because they, it's not in a bully sense, but the way the kids ask question, like, do you take a shower with this? Like, do you go to bed with this? And those things, yes, they're silly, but they hurt the other girls. But if we talk to them in advance and explaining to, explain that to them, those questions will not be there and there'll be more acceptance. Also with names, the way they pronounce their names is sometimes it's a it's form of bully. And I have a lot of my kids' com students complain about how they, they, it's not fair for the other, their peers not to call their right name. Uh, also, what a device advice I want to, uh, uh, mental illness. Uh, in my culture, mental illness is a taboo, and that's a problem. It's hard for the school system to approach, approach the family regarding this issue. And we have, we found a lot of resistance in that. So I think in our culture, we need to educate ourselves first regarding that issue, then we can talk about it in, in like in school setting or unless they talk about it with their fat with their doctors but they're not open to talk about it in schools to help their kids uh, 
uh, I always uh, give advice to the parents. I know the refugees, when they come, it's the first three years is just like in a surviving mode. So it's hard for them to engage in school. But with the school system, I found you need to be more involved as a parent in the school, get to know the teacher, the system, and that will help you understand what's going on in classroom, to volunteer, to be part of the PTA or the PTO, to to go to games and to events. So now you you can see the culture of your school the kids go to and that makes it easier for you to be part of it and for the teachers to see you and the community to see you to to welcome you more and to the, to see you part of the team that's my advice all right it's it he knows as as everybody's sharing some uh as some things as ideas I, I have a feeling that doubt is going to take all of this back and create change in his community um but um those are some really really great points they are thank you for sharing that um and we're so excited to be able to share this video with others as well to be able to take um the advice beyond this room uh you know as i look at this space i realize that uh, the, for the refugees in this space, we are the 3% in the entire world of people with that have pursued higher education. And Sharon, who is on this call, and Isaac, I believe, uh, are also uh, in Sudarshan. Uh, you're all pursuing higher education as well, which makes you about uh, less than 1% uh, in the entire world. Um, and so um, there are, you know, these are some amazing achievements. Um, in, in this group and you have amazing experience, uh, both uh, expertise and lived experience to talk about the topic today. We can all see that uh, there are solutions for refugees and immigrants to be fully part of the education system and by extension, uh, thrive in our society as a whole. Um, it just takes creative thinking, uh, will and action to accomplish. Um, and um, we really thank you all for joining us today and sharing your insights. Um, to close the panel, uh, we also want to share that this panel was hosted by the Refugee Storytelling Collective. We are individuals who are experts in our lived experiences. Uh, we share our stories and perspectives. We speak to the challenges that refugees and asylum seekers face and the contributions that we can make to society. And also, we want to give a huge shout out to Weave Tales, um, without which we wouldn't be able to accomplish what we've done today, uh, which is a nonprofit organization based in Jacksonville, Florida. Their work transcends uh, geography and incorporates the stories of refugees and immigrants from every corner of the globe, uh, thanks to the new online and mobile technologies. Uh, so thank you all uh, for participating today and uh, sharing your thoughts and expertise. Thank you. Bye-bye.